Uh, okay. So we left off <coughs> with, uh, we were looking at Tolkien's Portrait of Evil, which uh, I, I'm spending a fair bit of time on, but I think it's because it it's one of the uh, more uh, compelling and interesting aspects of the work. Uh, and uh, one of the things that appeals to people in the 20th century, we noted that uh, Tolkien's was the uh, Lord of the Rings was most people's favorite book. He was considered the author of the century by numerous of the British public to the scandal of the literary establishment. Um, and one of the questions is why that is. And I think the portrait of evil is certainly one of them, uh, one of the main reasons people can identify with it and what it is connected with furthermore. So that's why I've taken as long as I have. I won't spend the entirety of the course talking about it. Uh, you'll think, with Professor Franks and me, the problem of evil is our, our sole interest, and it's not. But um, we left off with the sixth instance in which the Ring of Power was, was put on, and it is the final one uh, that Frodo uh, uses. And we... Um, Frodo, uh, just to recall to your minds something you've probably read more than once and remember from the film as well, although the film departs from it a little bit, the way it's told, I think. Uh, he runs off, Frodo runs off into Samoth Naur, into the cracks of Mount Doom to, we presume, destroy the ring and leaves Sam behind to contend with Gollum, who's jumped on both of them. And when he goes into there, he finds that the vial of Galadriel will no longer work for him there, which is interesting. And at that point, we're told that the heart of the realm of Sauron, all other powers were here subdued. So evil has overcome good, if you will, in this place, which we need to reflect on uh, as Christians the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it or understood it, and yet here the light is snuffed out, and all things are brought under the power of the rings, which is why uh, Galadriel and the other elves said that they would not be able to resist the uh, force of Sauron uh, indefinitely. So yes, they would be able to hide up to a point, uh, and they would be the last stronghold, and they would stand, but in the end, uh, they would come under his dominion. That's what they said. That's why we can't just hide it, the ring here. It has to be set out and it has to be destroyed. But that's just a by the by. At that moment, <clears throat> right on the edge of the crack of doom, he gives up. So, it, it, And I think it's easy to miss this as well because he is charged with taking the ring to Mount Doom and destroying the ring. But he doesn't destroy the ring. In fact, the ring is destroyed, but it's not destroyed by him. Because he says, I have come, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do the, this deed. The ring is mine. And with that, then he puts it on for the sixth and final time. Now the question is, and it's, it's actually a very important question, does Frodo do this because he's been made to? That is, put in the ring. Or has he succumbed to an inner temptation? Remember, I just said that the uh, file of Galadriel has no power there. It's been subdued under it. Has, so has Frodo, when it comes down to it, remember back to what we talked about last time, these two portraits of evil, the Augustinian and Boethian view, which is that evil is a privatio boni, it's a privation of good, it actually has no essence, agency, or anything else. It's simply the absence of a good thing. That's the standard orthodox view. Or is it, uh, as we said, there are some, at least, senses in Tolkien's work. Is it a Manichaean view, where there is a, an actual power of evil, an agency to evil, that opposes the good? Because in terms of human experience, we have a, certainly have a sense that evil is, is like an agent, and Milton presents it that way even in his Paradise Lost. Remember, sin and death are given agency. 
which is rather novel, actually. I can't think of the precedent for it. Remember in, in Paradise Lost Book 2, uh, Satan, working his way upwards towards the gates of hell, finds sin there alongside death, and they are presented personified. An expansion on James 1, verse, I think it's 17. Um, with sin, sin giving birth to death and so forth. And Milton actually personifies them, so it gives them agency. Well, that, in a sense, uh, is doing the same thing that Tolkien is doing here. There's a sense of the personification of evil. But in terms of Orthodox Christian theology, that's not um, correct. And uh, Tolkien is very careful and correct on these things, I think. And uh, for further reference, I mentioned Augustine's Enchiridion, if you want to look to that, and it's very interesting. So he discusses this. Remember, Augustine himself was once a Manichaean. He, he ascribed to the Manichaean her heresy. He was also a Platonist. And he repented of that, and so he wrote against it in the Enchiridion. It's well worth uh, reading, actually, because it remains an issue, uh, particularly as the uh, privation of the good in your generation uh, accelerates as the inherited wisdom of the past is dispensed with and everyone is encouraged to be a like a uh, an orphan and figure things out for themselves without leaning on everyone anyone else's experience or holding on to the goods uh, that are inherent in nature which is the Tao which every past society has recognized but where we don't and our educators despise that, uh, big, big question, does evil have an agency? Because boy, if it doesn't, it's a hard thing to explain because it seems like there's, a, there's a, a conscious will behind it and an agency. So that's the question. Does he do it because he's been made to put on the ring? Now, finally, the ring is, and he talked about this as he was going up. He, he was under the power of the ring. He can't resist it and his hand's moving up and he can't, he can't stop it, stop it, Sam that Sam stops it. But has he now been forced to put on the ring, or has he simply succumbed to inner temptation? And what he says here in these words suggests the latter. He's succumbed to an inner temptation. I'll read them again. I have come, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. So I choose. Now, against that impression, there's this increasing sense that as he comes closer to the center uh, of the opposition to the good, that is where Sauron's eye is seen, I'm going to talk a fair bit more about the eye of Sauron uh, in this lecture, uh, there is a sense that all other powers are being subdued by a greater power. If that's the case, then Frodo has, he can no more help himself than if he had been fallen into a stream and been swept downstream. There's no power there. It's also interesting, and this is the note uh, made by um, Tom Shippey, whose book I highly recommend. Uh, Shippey, was, uh, Shippey has the uh, great benefit for the sake of scholarship of being an Anglo-Saxonist as well. I think he knew Tolkien personally and uh, has some understanding of his, his love of philology and, and makes various comments on uh, the meanings of words in, in older English senses and Norse languages and so forth. That's actually very beneficial to uh, understanding Tolkien. But he says that um, Frodo does not say, I choose not to do. He doesn't say, I choose not to do. He says, I do not choose now to do. You may so, say, so what? Uh, that's an academic difference. <clears throat> but the difference is, is significant. Frodo does not choose. The choice is made for him. I do not choose now to do. In the end, yet, it's, it's sort of an academic thing because Gollum makes the choice for him. He bites off his finger. And Frodo, by the way, or Frodo does not push him into the <coughs> pit because that would suggest that he wins in the end, right? Great, you bit off my finger and now I'm going to wrestle with you and I'm going to push you. That's not what happens in the book. In the book, he 
is so entranced by the ring and delighted with it that he dances and forgets where he is and he falls into the abyss, which is rather extraordinary. But remember, he said, if you, if you oppose me now, the ring itself will hold you responsible, and the ring has. It's not Frodo. So Frodo does not uh, defeat evil. The good does not vanquish evil. Evil devours itself in the end. And the, the uh, ring of power, which is a negation of the good, effectively negates itself. Remember he had said, if you touch me ever again, you shall be cast yourself into the fire of doom. Warns him. And he is, but he, but he doesn't, he himself doesn't do it. Now in the book, they want to have this struggle. And then of course, then there's the, the Hollywood shot where Frodo's hanging there on his, you know, by his fingertips and then Sam has to pull him up. Yeah. Hate that stuff. You know, don't let go, hold on, <laughs> whatever. So great, his friend Sam pulls him up. Okay, great, whatever. Uh, I don't, I, I, don't like it when they meddle with uh, plot developments, particularly when they're really important to a fellow like Tolkien and he wants to make a theological point, which he did. But this is going to be characteristic of the Peter Jackson movie. But I'm going to talk more about the uh, problems with the Peter Jackson movie. Compare the book to the movie in another lecture. So I'm not going to waste the time here on that. Uh, but remember, Tolkien is an academic, so if we may say it's an academic issue and therefore it doesn't matter, you're dealing with an academic for whom it did matter. So we have to track with the academic and say, well, why would he say it this way? So just because an ac that, uh, people who are not academics will dismiss academic debates as if the academic debates were irrelevant uh, when they might be, but actually, that is to be determined, which is precisely why academics do what they do. They want to get to the bottom of issues that might appear to be straightforward. And it doesn't matter in the end, because Gollum bites off his finger and falls in. So it doesn't matter whether he, at the very end, says, I choose not to do, or I do not choose to do. What's the difference? Well, for Tolkien, it's a big difference. Does he choose, or does he not choose? Because, that again, there's a, how, is, how does evil ultimately work? And if Frodo, by the way, does destroy evil, then good has conquered evil. And then there's no need, to some degree, for um, what follows, which is the scouring of the Shire. So evil hasn't been destroyed. It lingers on. And there will continue to be, to be murder and killing that happens afterwards. So evil has not gone away. But if he had destroyed the evil, then presumably that would have been the end of it all. And, it, and that's how the movie does end, by the way. There's no shire that's been scoured. There's no confrontation between um, Frodo and the other hobbits and Sharky. Right? And, and then there's no need to actually go off into the west either, to the Undying Lands. There's no need to do that because evil's been destroyed, but it hasn't been. And, and there's also, in terms of Christian theology, there's no need for then the incarnation and the crucifixion. And Tolkien is not going to tolerate that for a second. So this is, a, we said it's not an allegory, but it does have an application. And the application is, this is the nature of good and evil, and evil cannot be dis destroyed by good other than by God. No, no human and no creature, not even a hobbit who is like Christ in his humility, has sufficient humility to take care of evil. In fact, he himself in the end succumbs to it. So I think that's really, these are not academic issues. It's, it, the whole thing hinges upon that. So is Frodo guilty? Has he given in to temptation in the end? For me, the answer is yes. He has. He fails. The quest fails. Hmm. And therefore, even when he succeeds and everyone's patting him on the back, say, great job, Frodo, he knows that he has not. 
yes, the ring has been destroyed, but evil lingers on. It will no longer take the form it did before, but now it will be more insidious. And that's the world we live in, where there are no more elves or dwarves or wizards. There are men, and there is still evil. But now, it, And now it will not be an incarnate form, like the physical form of Sauron. He once was a creature, then he became an eye, and now he's going to be an, a disembodied spiritual threat. <clears throat> so that's the debate here between the Augustinian view and the Manichaean view, orthodoxy and heresy. So if you say it's an academic matter, well, I hope as Christian academics, you don't think it's just an academic matter. It's, it's a vital matter. So the Lord's Prayer, and this, again, uh, this is Shippey's observation, I think it's interesting, uh, contains seven clauses or requests, and the sixth and the seventh are, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Are the sixth and the seventh requests saying the same thing? Hmm. Remember, the sixth request, lead us not into temptation, are not a request that God doesn't tempt us because it says in James that God tempts no one. Whereas we do tempt God in the sense that we test his patience. Lead us not to presume so much as to make your anger burn against us. Lead us not into temptation. Don't let us be presumptuous about our sin. But deliver us from evil. Call for God to deliver us from the power that we have no power to deliver ourselves from. So the first is asking God to keep us safe from ourselves. And what's the threat to us? God. Actually, it's God's wrath. That's the danger. It's not sin. That's the, obviously a danger, but it's not the danger. The danger is God himself. The fear of the Lord ought to be the, the danger. Uh, the thing that motivates us. So the first, ask God to keep us safe from ourselves. The second, ask protection from the outside or deliverance. I think he, they, he presents it as, uh, should be as a Manichaean thing. I don't think that it is that. In both cases, it's a call to God for protection from ourselves and from all out, outward forms of evil in others. Uh, by the way, the Lord's Prayer scene was in Tolkien's mind when he wrote this scene, or he wrote so in a, a letter to uh, a fellow named David Masson. No relation so far as I know. And he'd been discussing criticisms uh, of him in The Portrait of Evil. So in the, la the last three clauses of the Lord's Prayer, this is from the, the, the letter, uh, including forgive us our trespasses, comments that these were the words which occurred to him and that the scene in the Samoth Nar was meant to be a fairy story exemplum of them. So I think that's really interesting. Comments, questions, yes? Pastor, I was thinking what you, what you just said about is there a difference between choosing or not choosing. Not cho yeah, and I was thinking of a song by Rush from their album Permanent Waves, <laughs> a song called Jacob's Ladder. Okay. Neil Peart uh, writes this, to choose not to decide, you have already made a decision. Sure. So I'm thinking that when Frodo <coughs> says what he says here, <coughs> but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. He already made a decision. Well, then he, and then he makes it clear. Yes. And so I... I, I the ring is mine. Yeah. So I, I, I'm saying, yeah, I, I love your take on this. Well, it's not my take. That's Tom Shippey's take, and I think it's entirely correct. Okay. Yeah. It's great observation. At, at the, at the, and it's, it's, a, it's a pivotal point. How do we understand the nature of evil? And furthermore, how do we understand the nature of the victory over evil that takes place here? Uh, it actually is evil devouring itself. 
uh, one of the uh, in in historical discussions, one of the things that people notice about uh, great powers of evil is that they seem, and it's portrayed by the way in the Lord of the Rings. I'll talk about this a bit in a minute. Uh, is that uh, forces of evil seem to have a unity insofar as they oppose uh, their opponents, the good, if you will, but they actually are factious uh, amongst themselves and there's nothing that unites them, no love, no solidarity, no real uh, embrace of the good. So think, take Nazi Germany. And, and in the end, was Nazi Germany destroyed by the Allies or did they destroy it themselves? It's a hard question to answer because without the mustering of the Allied forces in opposition, there could have been no end to the war. But in the end, did the Nazis not destroy themselves? It's here clear from Hitler's diaries and other things that Hitler hated the German people, even, which is extraordinary, because he's trying to advance the Aryan race and so forth. But he said they did, the reason they failed is because they didn't obey him sufficiently, and therefore they deserved to be destroyed. And so he sent them to their destruction. So he did crazy things towards his own country because they didn't obey him enough. Like very bad, I mean his generals rebelled against him, militarily this is insane. So he had to execute them and so they did all manner of things. In the end, did they not slit their own throats? And I think they, there's a case to be made at any rate. Hmm. It's not that there's, it does it all on its own, although ultimately if, if evil really affirms no good thing or it's the privation of the good, um, when it has consumed enough, like cancer, when it's consumed enough of the body cells, it, it, it actually then starts retreating because there's nothing left to feed upon. It's like a parasite on the good. Happens in politics as well, which I don't want to comment on too much here. But yes? I was just going to say, um, I read recently, um, someone actually put it, one day we were Nazis and the next day we were not. And it was a sort of obvious. And the same thing happened with the Soviet Union, by the way, with the end of the Cold War. Worldwide communism and the threat, I grew up under it. Um, it was there and it was believed to be a permanent fixture in modern life, really, is the hostility, political, military, economic, between the communist bloc on the one hand and the West, the free West. And then it, it almost overnight went down. The Berlin Wall fell, the borders were open, open, the Czech border was open, the Berlin Wall not long after fell, and then the whole thing collapsed. And uh, political uh, expressions of communism, and there are many advocates in the academy suddenly grew silent for a time. They're still there, but they just stopped because it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing already, but now there was no, there was no case to be made. Did they go away? Did they say that actually the freedoms of the West were what won in the end? They said, no, it's, it's not true. So then cultural Marxism took off. I talked about this in a lecture on the subject, which I think it did. It still advanced under the politics of the new left. So it's not, we're gonna have a war, a physical war and beat them down, but uh, we're gonna attack the, the uh, permanent things of the culture, namely the religious convictions and the, uh, the goodness of the family and the Tao, which has been under assault for many a year, as Lewis notes to us. That has not gone away. Well, these are not actually political things, they're spiritual assaults. I don't think the spiritual assault has gone away with the fall of Marx, uh, with the, of the communist East. I think it's now everywhere around us. And now it can't be identified with, a, with a, an enemy, as it were. So evil devours itself in the end. How does this work? So I, I just said that in the end, um, Gollum, who has been so identified, or so identified himself with the ring that he calls himself precious, and the ring precious, it's the thing that he loves above all other things. And the effect of that is the same effect that we see in 
um, things that we might experience or see others around us experience, we experience them as well, but we don't see them as clearly because of our own sin, uh, namely the, the uh, effect of sin, which is what happens to um, Smeagol. Like the Cain and Abel story, he slays his friend Beagle, then claims that it was a present that was given to him as a lie. So he kills him like Cain and Abel, slays a, his kindred, takes it for himself, lies about how he came about it, and then isolates himself from all the other creatures of his life. It's like a, a river hobbit, so, described as something of that, that sort. So he, first of all, murders his kindred, so someone very close to him, his friend, for the sake of this shiny ring, which, which appeals to him. Then he, uh, so he shuns the uh, society of other hobbit-like creatures so that he lives entirely by himself, so isolation. Remember I talked about the first aspect of the uh, evil is that originates in the desire for autonomy. And that means isolation. And remember what I said about the myth of the orphan, which is so appealing. So appealing, people keep writing books and filming movies on orphans. Cut off from the human family, the means of uh, passing on inherited wisdom. Cut off. Um, so he does that. He cuts himself off. He's also shunned by other hobbits. Well, why? Because he's antisocial. So even if he wanted to, they find him, his company loathsome. Uh, he becomes so degenerated as a uh, creature that he is almost unrecognizable as a hobbit or a hobbit-like creature, whatever he was. But he's something like a hobbit. He will no longer season his food. In fact, he will no longer cook his food. Now, cooking is a form of culture. Animals don't cook their food. They eat it raw. So does Gollum. He can't, he, he can't abide the cooked food. It's a symbol of culture. Note that it also has, you know, we would say hygienic effects and so if it kills off the bacteria. Never mind that. It's a symptom of culture, a symbol of culture. And, and he can't, can't abide the seasoning that is on it either. So the cultural improvement of the taste of the food. He despises culture. He want, he's going back to nature. He can't eat the lembas bread. He, it's, he chokes on it. It's like poison. The lembas bread uh, is, has a, is a sort of a symbol of the Eucharist. Or communion wafer. It has a spiritual virtue that strengthens. But it doesn't strengthen him. He can't swallow it. He can't even eat. He can't even eat regular food, never mind spiritual food. Um, and then finally, he, um, ha having uh, made himself like this, uh, he also loses the power of speech. So he doesn't converse. There's no communication. Not with communication, there's a, a common things, a community, a unity through language. Now he says, Gollum, Gollum, which is the, a guttural sound that comes up from his throat. And he calls himself by that same word. He self-identifies himself as that sound. That's the primal utterance of, of, that comes from Smeagol's throat is now Gollum. He calls himself that as well as precious. So he loves himself, but his self has no good left in it. He's hollowing himself out. He becomes shrunken. Note that he self-identifies. He no longer see, he identifies himself, sees himself as identified by anything else, by his parents. Changes his name. 
he, he doesn't identify with the other creatures of the, his world. He doesn't certainly doesn't identify with the Luvatar. He self-identifies by the sound that he makes, which is an inarticulate sound. Now this, if you have any understanding of the history of ideas, is very much like Rousseau's and Herder, which I mentioned, their view of language, which in its origins, language was emphatic, uh, expressive, and emotionally true. In, and poetry reflected that. So the best language is in poetry, because poetry is the most um, emotionally true language. And, and after the Romantics, uh, following Rousseau, uh, language is seen as emotional expression. That's what language is. which is the standard definition that most of you come to university with. It's emotional expression. And therefore, everyone wants to do creative writing so they can express their emotions in terrible writing that nobody wants to read but they think is great. The sin of self-deceit. I'm not saying you can't write, but it's probably true. Based on that view of language at any rate, you haven't lost the power of speech, clearly not. But if you think emotional expression is actually moving to others, it's not. The Rousseau's noble savage utters himself and groans and cries. So he says, now that is where we get the portrait, by the way, of the caveman. That's how life begins, as primitive. And then, after a time language develops and religion comes along and codifies that language and then laws and rules come along and then philosophy comes along to get rid of all of the emotional expressions of what we call gods which are no gods but we associate our fears our emotional fears with the god thor or whatever that's the thunder god so it's just a projection of our emotional expressions and then come the philosophers and say that's nonsense if those are gods then they have to be good and true and beautiful, they can't possibly be immoral. So philosophy plays a role, and then comes along the age of the sciences, and they look at knowledge with more rational terminology. Yes, but it's not so poetic or powerful because it, it loses touch with the emotions. But anyway, that's the account of how language evolves. You've heard it. And we're so sophisticated now in our language that we don't even have to use language. We can use the smartphone that everybody's using and stick in front of them. This is, this is great. I'm sophisticated. I have a smartphone. It renders you inarticulate. You look like droids walking around like zombies getting killed on the Toronto streets. It has the effect. Wow. You know, I'm, and I'm linked in. I'm connected with everyone all at once. Isn't that great? I'm communicating. Yes, but do you have any sense of a community of others? Or is it isolated to cut you off, to make you lonely and anxious? That's what psychologists tell us. It's the effect of it. So the appearance of communication without any of the virtue of community. You can't really be, have an argument on Facebook either, or Twitter or whatever. It's not really possible. I don't do it. I use social media, but I'm not, I never try and get into arguments really. It's just fruitless. And I have no problem with getting into arguments, but that's not the medium to, to do it. So it has that effect on him. Now that's very interesting. It's very interesting because of the, uh, what Tolkien has already stated about uh, the power of language. Remember, he, in Mythopoeia. And his interest in words, which is profound. But the, when evil becomes more and more evil, so it strengthens. Along with the strengthening, it loses the very things that allow it to have genuine strength, may, namely working in solidarity with others in a community. There are no communities of the vicious. There are criminals, by the way, who gather together for a common purpose. How do they work? They're quite effective, and they're, they talk about a brotherhood and so forth, all that. But what are they united in? A common cause to do a bad thing. And you will find that in uh, gangs like that, there's vicious infighting, flood feuds, all that manner of things, and power is held to by terrific coercive force. So you kill 
people that oppose you as a threat of violence. You get in the position there, and then everybody's terrified. But we're going to gather and work in this way. But ultimately, these, these gangs, whether they're uh, just little local gangs of hooligans or whether they're on the mafia style or whether they're in government, ultimately, they undermine themselves. Because there is no, there's not, they have no solidarity with one another. There's nothing good that, that binds them other than the threat of power. So there's the course of nature of evil, which I talked about from the outset. They are tied through hatred and fear. That's it. And so they consume themselves. So King Theoden says, oft evil, oft evil will shall evil mar. It's a little aphoristic expression of this characteristic of evil that it consumes itself has that nature. So uh, terrorism needs to be condemned by all people and its means must be uh, avoided by all free people because it is only negative. What is terrorism? It's to create fear in your opponents. But the means destroy the communities that are the purveyors of terrorism. No good community can, can actually exist by means of terrorism. Look at the countries that use it. Are they doing well? You can take other people's stuff. You can take people's other people's knowledge. You can take other people's uh, technology. In the end, that just delays the inevitable self-destruction of the evil motive. That is all-consuming. That doesn't mean it doesn't need to be resisted, it does, but, but, but free people must not use the tactics of terrorism. Which is why many people will say that uh, torture also ought to be avoided by free peoples. Let's not use torture or coercive means. It's a very uh, <coughs> hot subject because, because uh, Torture has been used to extract confessions forever, even by Christians. It's used. Um, one of the arguments against it is, it is a coerced answer is hardly reliable, because people will say anything to stop the pain and suffering. It might be true, but it might not be, and it's hard to discern. <laughs> but they have no transcendent good purpose. It's just a, uh, um, a means to an end that unites them. Uh, having said that, the tendency of evil to devour itself is not really particularly comforting. If we just wait around long enough, they're going to devour themselves because the threat of evil is so great that it must be resisted. And that's Tolkien and Lewis's shared conviction. Pacifism is not going to do it because evil is such a uh, of such a threat that it must be resisted, and, but it must be resisted rightly. We must not use the weapon of the enemy against it because we can't. Even if we gain the victory, we lose the war. So Legolas, remember, I mean, the elves are in, in uh, the movie, but even in the books, seen as sort of transcendent creatures, superior to men. But Legolas, like Galadriel, like all of the elves, are mistaken in their uh, opinions about things. So Legolas says that enemies of the orc are likely to be our friends. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's common you hear people say such things. Uh, Aragorn disagrees with them. Aragorn is wise, by the way. Aragorn says the enemy brought his own enemy with him. In other words, it's self-destruction, which is true. The fighting broke out amongst them, even in, uh, in uh, if you think about when Frodo is captured, the fighting that breaks out among the orcs over his, um, his, his shirt of chain mail. Uh, and then there's huge slaughter in the ranks over this and over who's going to be 
uh, supreme amongst them because they're the orcs and then there's the Urukai and that sort of stuff. And there's just a sort of internecine destruction there. Um, and Frodo says that the, the mutual enmity between the orcs is not to be, is not surprising. By the way, Frodo grows in his wisdom as he grows in his suffering. As he resists the power of evil and knows that he can't use it, he also gains in his wisdom and he becomes a wiser and wiser figure as he progresses. So does Sam. That's why they're equipped after the whole thing is over. Now you, says Gandalf, can deal with evil on your own. The, the shower, that shower, the shire has been scoured, but you don't need me anymore. Why? Because you've known that you cannot use power without moral considerations. You cannot do evil. You can only uphold the good. You're going to restrain yourselves. There'll be a just war here. Frodo is so convinced of it that he will not even wield a blade. He doesn't forbid others from doing it, but he won't do it himself, which is interesting. So Frodo says that the enmity amongst the orcs is the spirit of Mordor. That's his phrase. It is the spirit of Mordor. Self-loathing. Because all, it's loathing of all good. And we can't get much hope from that, having said that. Not much hope in evil's self-hatred. So they're going to have to be wise, and they're going to have to be patient. Which, let me tell you, uh, I am not good at patience. But uh, when I say that, I've not met many people who are good at it, so... But patience is recognizing the good and waiting uh, prudentially for God's providence to work and, hope, and not being devoured by evil means, climbing the corporate ladder, if you will. A lot of people think that they can just get to a position of power, and then when they get there, then they'll implement all the good things that the, their leaders are not doing, and they find that doesn't work that way. You get to the top and you have no means of, of fighting the good fight uh, within yourself. There no, there's no virtue in you because the virtue hasn't been tested in any way. <laughs> um, so it almost seems like an unfair fight. And this is what Lewis, if you recall back in Paralandra, says that he, he is in a battle that he can't win. Because his, his opponent is a, is a spiritual power, ultimately, and he's only a mortal man. And he doesn't, his, his opponent never tires, and he gets tired. And he can't lie. He has to tell the truth, and his opponent can lie all he wants. And use every trick in the book. So it's not a fair fight. He's, it's an unfair fight, and he has to get into it. So he says, it's not fair. I, I, want, I don't want to do this. And then he realizes he ha that's not an option for him. He has to obey. He's in the fight. Remember that phrase Gandalf uses? You know, he says, Frodo says that he wished he had not been called to this, and, and Gandalf says it's not ours to choose. These are evil times that I wish I'd never, the ring had never come to me, right? That, that sort of language. Yes, it's, that's not ours to choose. Ours is to obey and do the right thing. Hard lessons. Um, and nobody likes that one particularly. Um, so how about the other means of temptation? Um, and these are connected with technology. I want to talk about the use of technology. And, Tolkien's connection of the ring of power with technological means. Because we see other um, means of technological um, heightening of human power, like um, Galadriel's mirror or the Palantir, the seeing stones. They're sort of ancient means of, of amplifying human capacities. Um, when Sauron is defeated, he 
uh, Tolkien makes it clear that he will never return again in bodily form. At first, he was a, a figure um, like any other figure. We see the back, back flashes when Isildur cut off the ring from his finger. He was a like a physical figure, and the ring gets cut off. He disappears. He comes back a second time, and now he's just the eye. And the eye seems to have intensified his power. It, even though he has been physically reduced, uh, spiritually, he seems to have grown stronger. The threat has grown stronger because it be, can't be fought in a physical.